Good afternoon. Sorry, we are starting a few minutes late here. Welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be back. It's less good to be back when you arrive back at 2.30 in the morning. But here we are. Um, a couple things at the top and then happy to uh, take your questions. Uh, first, since the earliest days of this administration, we have talked about, but more importantly implemented, a foreign policy that delivers for the American people. In other words, it's a foreign policy that aims to make life better, easier, safer for American workers, families, and communities. It is rooted in the recognition that foreign, economic, and domestic policy are inextricably linked, and that domestic competitiveness, national security, and a strong middle class are mutually reinforcing. And that was precisely the agenda we executed against over the last few days in Italy and the UK. Just look at the priorities from the trip. First, in Rome, uh, the president cemented progress on the global minimum tax, a major achievement secured through American, and in this case, through presidential leadership that will help stop a global corporate race to the bottom and improve our capacity to make investments in workers and in communities at home. And earlier today, you heard from one of our senior officials uh, offering some more context on the GMT. Second, we took joint steps with Europe to reestablish historical transatlantic trade flows in steel and aluminum, providing a relief to American companies and to American consumers across the board. Additionally, we're laser focused on lower, lowering energy prices and securing our supply chains. On the latter, we worked with our partners to ensure stable, secure global supply chains for critical goods, medicine, and technology that the American people and the American economy depend on. We further advance the Build Back Better World initiative, the so-called B3W initiative, which promotes a high standard, climate-friendly global infrastructure uh, around the world. B3W indeed helps our partners overseas, but it also helps American firms and American workers compete globally on every aspect of infrastructure, from the physical to the digital uh, to the health realm as well. And of course, in Glasgow, we confronted climate change, an existential challenge, but also the greatest economic opportunity of our time. And you've heard the president make this point repeatedly, including uh, in his remarks yesterday in Glasgow. We can and will create good paying union jobs and new industries as we address the climate crisis. During COP26, President Biden and Secretary Blinken uh, held productive meetings with leaders from around the globe to step up that global ambition and action in tackling the climate crisis. They demonstrated that the United States is back in the Paris Agreement back at the table and back to leading the, with the power of our example. They demonstrated our commitment to support those from the front lines of the climate crisis. We accelerated our progress through diplomacy uh, in a number of ways. We reached an agreement by more than 100 countries representing 85% of the world's forest to stop deforestation by 2030. We released the US long-term strategy to outline how we'll get to a net zero economy uh, by 2050. We developed the, methane, the U.S. Methane Emissions Reduction Action Plan, uh, which included new robust rules that will reduce emissions, that will cut consumer costs, and support job growth. We announced more than 100 governments, including some of the world's biggest emitters, have now joined the Global Methane Pledge. We created partnerships like Net Zero Worlds, the Clean Energy Demand Initiative, and First Movers Coalition to drive innovation and new technology. And we established the President's Emergency Plan for Adaptation and Resilience, or PREPARE, uh, as the acronym goes, to support climate ad adaptation efforts for more than a half a billion people around the world. This must be a whole of society effort, not only from nations around the world, but also the private sector, uh, philanth philanthropies, uh, and others who are dedicating themselves to climate action, uh, including climate activists around the world. Action by state, local, and tribal governments paired with societal leadership is what propelled America forward and brought down emissions even as uh, we were faced with the task of reentering the Paris Agreement in the earliest days of this administration, on the first day of this administration. The President underscored that investing in a clean energy future is an enormous opportunity for every country to create good paying jobs and spur our economic recovery, uh, which is what uh, his framework will do. It will be uh, the largest investment in American history to combat the climate crisis. It will cut emissions by well over one gigaton in 2030. It will save consumers money on their energy bills, provide tax credits to install solar, solar panels and weatherize homes, 
leverage manufacturing credits to ensure U.S. energy is clean and competitive, and accelerate our shift to electric vehicles and school buses. This is about jobs. It's about competitiveness versus complacency, as you heard from the, pleasant, the president yesterday from Glasgow. This is about making the world a safer, cleaner, healthier place for children all around the world. It's in the interest of every single nation to act and to make a generational investment in our climate resilience and in our workers and communities. That is precisely what the United States uh, is doing and what we will continue to do. Second, uh, I am pleased to announce the appointment of Ambassador William H. Moser as the Director of the Bureau of Overseas Buildings, Op uh, Buildings Operations, or OBO. This appointment underscores the importance placed on the mission and the work of OBO to build and operate secure, sustainable, technologically innovative, and resilient di diplomatic pla platforms that are produced by uh, the best in American architecture, construction, and facility management. Ambassador Moser is a familiar face around OBO as he served as OBO's Principal Deputy Director from 2015 to 2017 and Acting Director from 2017 to 2018. He's held several senior leadership positions as a member of the Senior Foreign Service, including as Ambassador to Moldova and Kazakhstan, uh, and has demonstrated leadership and management skills needed to provide uh, the global platform to advance U.S. policy overseas. We look forward to OBO's achievements and contributions to U.S. diplomacy uh, around, under his leadership, and we welcome Ambassador Moser to the job. So with that, happy to take your questions. Okay. Thank you, and welcome back. I hope you enjoyed uh, Rome and Glasgow. Did what? Uh, yeah, without us. Well, well I'm sure that that was an added bonus. Everyone, so. uh, everyone was welcome. <laughs> no one was excluded. <laughs> um, uh, let's start with uh, Ethiopia because we understand that um, Ambassador Feltman is going to be going there, possibly other places. Uh, so if I could kind of combine this with Sudan because they happen to be next to each other and they're both in his portfolio. Um, what's he going to be doing in Ethiopia? Is he going to Sudan? He just put out this joint statement with the Brits, with the Saudis, and the Emiratis. What do you expect out of that, if anything, from the other, mainly the Saudis and the Emiratis, from the others who are on that? And uh, is he going anywhere else? Sure. Uh, let me start with Ethiopia, then we'll uh, move to uh, Sudan. Obviously, a lot of uh, action and activity to speak to. Uh, when it comes to Ethiopia, uh, let me make the point that we are gravely concerned uh, by the escalating violence, uh, by the expansion of the fighting that we've seen in northern Ethiopia and in regions throughout the country. Uh, we are concerned with the growing risk to the unity and the integrity of the Ethiopian state. Uh, the safety of U.S. citizens, U.S. government personnel, their dependents, and the security of our facility uh, remains uh, among our highest priorities. And we note the nationwide state of emergency declared by Ethiopia's Council of Ministers, and we urge all parties to use restraint, end hostilities, and ensure civilians uh, and their rights are uh, respected. Um, as the Secretary said uh, just a couple days ago, uh, we have been alarmed by reports uh, of the TPLF takeover um, in, of Desi and Kambolcha. Uh, continued fighting only prolongs the humanitarian crisis uh, that is afflicting far too many people uh, in Ethiopia uh, today. All parties, all parties must stop military operations uh, and begin ceasefire negotiations uh, without preconditions. Uh, many of you also uh, saw that Ambassador Feltman uh, delivered remarks at the U.S. Institute for Peace uh, yesterday on Ethiopia, uh, where he made uh, some of these uh, same points. Um, we are not only uh, engaged in diplomacy ourselves, uh, but we are working with international partners uh, to address the crisis in Ethiopia, including through action with the UN, the African Union, uh, other relevant partners and, and bodies as well. Uh, you are correct that Ambassador Feltman will be traveling to uh, Ethiopia on November 4th and November 5th. Um, he will be traveling there because we, as I said before, are increasingly troubled uh, by uh, the expansion of combat operations and intercommunal violence uh, in parts of Ethiopia. 
uh, and we are closely monitoring the situation. Uh, we call on all Ethiopians to commit to peace and resolution of grievances uh, through dialogue. And Ambassador Feltman, uh, in his travels there, uh, will have an opportunity uh, to um, uh, continue the discussions that have been ongoing, um, including with uh, the Ethiopian government uh, for uh, some time now. Uh, in terms of any follow-on travel, um, we have confirmed that he's traveling to uh, Ethiopia uh, tomorrow, no uh, November 4th. Uh, don't have any additional travel to announce at this time, but of course we'll keep you posted um, if his plans uh, do change. Um, let me go on to Sudan, um, because this is also uh, an area um, that falls uh, under uh, Ambassador Feltman's uh, remit. And of course there too, uh, we have been working concertedly uh, over uh, the past week plus. Uh, and over the weekend, uh, we saw a remarkable demonstration of the aspirations of the Sudanese people. Uh, we applaud the millions of Sudanese who came out on October 30th. Uh, they came out to defend the country's revolution, uh, to make clear that their democratic aspirations uh, have not been uh, abated. Uh, they were clear that Sudan's democratic transition must continue. Uh, we join them. Uh, we call for the civilian-led transitional government established under the 2019 Constitutional Declaration to be restored. Uh, we are steadfast in standing with uh, Sudan's people uh, on their path of freedom, peace, and justice. Uh, we do regret the loss of life that has occurred uh, in recent days, uh, and we stand in solidarity with the family and friends of those, uh, of those who were killed, uh, those who have been uh, wounded. And we join the Sudanese people in calling for justice and accountability for violations uh, and abuses of uh, human rights. Um, Matt, you referred to a joint statement that came out just a few minutes ago. Uh, this was a, a joint statement by the Quad for Sudan. Uh, to translate, that is a grouping of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, uh, the United Kingdom uh, and the United States. Uh, I would like to um, call your attention to really the crux of this statement. Uh, these four countries, the United States included, came together to make clear that, quote, we call for the full and immediate restoration of its, Sudan's, civilian-led transitional government institutions. We call upon all parties to strive for cooperation and unity in reaching this critical objective. Uh, it goes on to say, in that vein, we encourage the release of all those detained in connection with the recent events and the lifting of the state of emergency. As you know, uh, in both Rome uh, and Glasgow, the secretary had an opportunity to meet with a number of uh, his counterparts. We met with uh, foreign minister, uh, with the Saudi foreign minister. We met with uh, the Emirati foreign minister. Uh, we met uh, with others who uh, have uh, a stake uh, in a stable, uh, democratic, civilian-led uh, Sudan. Uh, and this was uh, the message we've heard. So it is not just the United States calling for the immediate restoration of the civilian-led uh, government uh, in Sudan. It is uh, much of the international community uh, that is coming together. In this case, uh, that includes the United Kingdom, uh, but it includes uh, some of Sudan's uh, regional neighbors and partners, uh, Saudi Arabia, <laughs> Uh, and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, we are not alone in this. We are very much united uh, with our allies, with our partners around the world on the imperative of a swift return to democratic governance, a swift return to the civilian-led transition uh, in Sudan, uh, and we will continue to work uh, with our partners uh, <coughs> to bring that about. We also know, um, even as we um, push this forward, that failure to do so, failure to restore civilian-led government in Sudan uh, will only further isolate Sudan from the international community. We've already talked about the suspension of uh, our own emergency support funding, some $700 million uh, that were suspended uh, in the immediate aftermath of the military takeover uh, last week. But beyond that, more than $4 billion in international assistance from bilateral partners and international uh, financial institutions, and at least 19 billion in international debt relief is already at risk. Uh, we, and as I said before, the broader international community are committed to supporting the Sudanese people uh, and their legitimate aspirations for freedom, for peace, uh, and for justice 
uh, as well. Right, now, just uh, on these two countries in specific, uh, specifically, the administration and, 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 and just in terms of the administration and not uh, the Saudis, the Emiratis, or, or anyone else, but just this administration, you guys have been warning both of these countries for months now about against, uh, you know, leaders in these countries against taking these actions. You've had a parade of officials, a mini parade of officials, go through both, including Samantha Power, including Ambassador Feltman himself, who was in Khartoum just hours before, you know, this, this, this coup happened. You have that now suspended $700 million in uh, assistance to the Sudan. You have kicked Agoa or are about to kick Ethiopia out of uh, 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 the African Growth and Opportunity Act. And they don't seem to be listening. Uh, listening. Are it, is there? Do you have any concern that your your message is not being uh, heeded, or that you're being ignored? Uh, Matt, obviously, I don't want to group Sudan and Ethiopia um, uh, and, and treat them as one and the same. These are very distinct I don't cases. Don't want you to treat them as the same, but they happen to be right next to each other, and they happen to be the Horn of Africa, which is the the portfolio of. Well, and it's precisely why Ambassador Feltman was in Sudan in the first place. Uh, he has been uh, a frequent visitor uh, to Sudan uh, in recent weeks uh, to work on a number of issues, uh, including the GERD, but also uh, our concern uh, for the viability uh, of the uh, civilian-led transitional government, uh, given some of the indications. Uh, that uh, the international community had seen uh, in the weeks and the days uh, preceding the military takeover uh, that something uh, was afoot there. Uh, so uh, again, I don't uh, want you to confuse, um, uh, uh, I don't want you to think this relationship is causal. Um, he was there no, no, um, no. because, not because the world. I'm wondering, no, I'm not saying it's your fault or his fault or whoever. I'm just asking you if you are concerned that the message that you have been delivering to both in both of these countries over the course of the last several months hasn't been listened to. These are, these are difficult challenges. Uh, these are difficult challenges. Uh, again, to take each separately because these are separate challenges. Uh, in Sudan, um, the pace of the democratic transition uh, has been a source of frustration for some. Uh, the fact that uh, Ambassador Feltman has been such a regular visitor there, had been such a regular visitor, is indicative of some of the challenges that the international community recognized. Uh, the uh, civilian-led uh, transitional government uh, was encountering. Uh, we have been there. Uh, Ambassador Feltman has been there. We've spoken out. Uh, we've engaged in private diplomacy to indicate our support uh, for the civilian-led transitional government. Um, now, of course, uh, the, uh, the military, uh, as we saw the other week, had other plans in mind. Uh, but it is notable that you have seen uh, the international community, uh, including some of uh, Sudan's most important regional neighbors, uh, swiftly condemn uh, these anti-democratic actions, call for the immediate restoration of the civilian-led transitional uh, government, uh, and have made clear in no uncertain terms uh, where they stand. Uh, and they stand with the United States, they stand with uh, the international community uh, in making clear that the military's takeover uh, must not uh, be allowed to stand. Now, of course, uh, Ethiopia is a separate challenge. Uh, this is something that we have been hard at work on uh, from the earliest days of this administration. The violence, of course, predates uh, this administration. Uh, tomorrow, I believe, November 4th, marks one year uh, of conflict in Tigray. It's one year of uh, devastating implications uh, for the people of Tigray. Uh, in, in recent months, in recent weeks, we've seen the violence escalate. We've seen the violence uh, spread uh, to other uh, regions. But here, too, uh, we have been working very closely uh, with our partners, including uh, those uh, in the African Union and the UN, uh, to make clear uh, to all of the parties, the Ethiopi Ethiopian government, the TPLF, uh, Eritrea, that uh, these hostilities must come to an end. Uh, and uh, the path forward lies in diplomacy. The path forward uh, lies in um, negotiations uh, that should start immediately 
and without preconditions uh, to put an end to the violence, but importantly, to ensure that the people of Ethiopia, uh, the people of Tigray, uh, have access to the humanitarian supplies, the humanitarian assistance uh, that they so desperately need. And when it comes to that humanitarian assistance, no country uh, has done more than the United States uh, to um, uh, provide uh, the people of Ethiopia uh, with these life-saving life uh, assistance and supplies. Uh, we'll continue to do that, um, but it is also why, as we made clear yesterday, that any effort to hinder uh, humanitarian assistance, to hinder uh, the delivery of humanitarian aid, will be met with uh, a significant response uh, in using all appropriate tools. Uh, and yesterday, uh, we spoke of uh, another uh, tool that may be called upon on January 1st uh, if we do not see a change uh, in conduct when it comes to uh, human rights abuses and the provision of humanitarian aid uh, and access. Yes? You mentioned uh, two times that the EU invites Egypt to sign uh, on, on the statement and uh, what was the response of the EU So this was a statement that was put forward by the Quad for Sudan. Uh, and the Quad for Sudan includes us and includes our British partners, our Emirati partners, and our Saudi partners. Uh, Sudan is an issue that we have discussed uh, with a number of um, uh, uh, countries in the region uh, and well beyond. We've been in, con we've been in contact uh, with our uh, counterparts in Egypt uh, as well, knowing that uh, the more we uh, speak and act with one voice, uh, the more our message, uh, the clearer our message will be uh, to uh, those in Sudan. Our affirmative message that we stand with the Sudanese people, including the millions who took to the streets uh, over the last weekend, who took to the streets peacefully, I should em emphasize, uh, but also to uh, General Burhan and, and those behind uh, this military takeover. Uh, that their actions uh, will not be tolerated, that the international community will not uh, stand by um, unless they return Sudan uh, to civilian rule and its transitional government. Uh, the military does not have the ability to select Sudan's civilian leaders. Uh, that is very clear. The 2019 uh, transitional constitution is very clear uh, on that front, and, and that's what we'll continue to stand by. But, but why, why Egypt? didn't sign on this statement. You'll, ha you'll have to ask the Egyptians. Uh, you you'll, 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 you'll have to ask the Egyptians for, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, for, for their position on this. What I can tell you is this was put forward by the Quad for Sudan. Uh, the Quad for Sudan includes us and includes our British partners, our Emirati, Emirati partners, uh, and our Saudi uh, partners. There are a number of countries uh, who, around the world, who are in, in um, uh, complete and total agreement with the United States. Uh, and with these countries, with other countries, that the military's takeover uh, is unacceptable uh, and that it must be immediately reversed. Again, this was a statement by the Quad for Sudan. You have heard other countries speak out. You've heard other countries uh, make that message very clear. Um, but I'm not here to speak for other countries. Uh, I'm here to speak for the United States. Yes, yes Francisco. Has there been any interaction lately by the administration? Ambassador Feldman or anyone else with the militaries, with General Burhan in the last days. And do, do you sense that there is some path, some openness to, 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 to going back to the status quo ante from the military right now? Do you have some openness? Uh, do you see some, op some well, openness? Uh, so I will say that there has been engagement um, from uh, individuals in this building. Of course, we read out uh, Secretary Blinken's discussion with uh, Prime Minister Hamdak. Uh, there has been engagement from others in this building uh, to the Sudanese military uh, to make very clear uh, where the United States, where uh, the international community stands. I wouldn't want to characterize uh, those discussions, um, but uh, we have left no ambiguity whatsoever uh, about uh, what the international community is very clear uh, that needs to happen, and that is a, a swift restoration of the civilian-led transitional government. We've been very clear. Um, about the potential implications and costs uh, if this military takeover uh, is not reversed. Uh, we have already taken action to that end in terms of suspending the $700 million uh, in bilateral assistance. Uh, and as I said before, there are billions upon billions uh, at stake uh, in terms of debt relief, in terms of 
um, uh, financing from international lending institutions. Uh, if the Sudanese military uh, is unwilling to uh, relent. But this is something that we are working at uh, day in, day out uh, with uh, our uh, with Sudanese interlocutors, uh, but also with partners in the region and well beyond. Said. Uh, could you explain to us the Israeli role with the Sudanese? Uh, because there was a delegation uh, that visited with uh, Burhan, General Burhan, and so on. And uh, today, just now, as a matter of fact, um, uh, uh, an Israeli website, Walla, uh, claims that you guys have asked Israel to help, you know, in sort of uh, reverse the, the, uh, the court. Have you done that? Are you in touch with the Israelis to basically, you know, convince the Sudanese that they should, you know, backtrack, or Burhan should backtrack? We have been in touch uh, at very senior levels mm -hmm. uh, with very senior interlocutors right. uh, throughout the region and beyond, yeah. and that includes Israel. with Israel. Includes uh, Israel. Th okay. That includes with Israel. Um, but again, I, uh, I'm going to leave that those diplomatic discussions and diplomatic channels, um, but we have discussed this with uh, virtually uh, everyone with a stake uh, in a democratic, stable, peaceful Sudan, uh, and that is uh, just about everyone in the region uh, and many countries well beyond the region. So. I wanted just to drill down specifically on, you know, there's talk of, of Prime Minister Hamdok um, being restored to his position. You know, is that is that sufficient um, for the international acceptance that you were, that you were kind of talking about? And you mentioned um, the protesters in Sudan on, on Saturday. Um, a lot of those people out on the streets, they're, you know, rather than calling for the status quo ante, they're actually saying, you know, these coup leaders have, have broke, breached the trust of this transition and the military should fully withdraw from Sudanese politics. You know, is that is that a realistic um, uh, aim? And, you know, would, would it be sufficient just to return to where things were before? What we are calling for uh, and what you've seen our partners call for, including in the context of the Quad statement uh, that came out today, uh, is a restoration of the 2019 Constitutional Declaration. Uh, and what that established uh, was a civilian-led uh, government, um, uh, a civilian-led government that worked in partnership uh, with uh, the Sudanese military. Uh, I'm not going to offer a roadmap from here about uh, what that restoration might look like in practice. What we are focused on uh, is a restoration of that underlying framework, uh, the 2019 uh, Constitutional Declaration. Uh, that, in turn, uh, will dictate what is and what is not uh, acceptable um, uh, because it is a document that is uh, Sudanese in origin uh, and it is, uh, has been endorsed uh, and has been the, the, the blueprint um, for uh, the past several years. And that's what uh, we continue to stand by. That's what the Sudanese people uh, continue to stand by, uh, including with the massive demonstrations, peaceful demonstrations, uh, that we saw in Sudan over the weekend. Uh, anything else on Sudan? Yes, Abby? On Ethiopia, Sudan, anything? Uh, sure, Nazir. Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan, let's, we'll come back to that. Uh, Great, uh, Ethiopia. Um, given the escalating levels of violence in Ethiopia, is there any change to the status of the U.S. Embassy or any consideration uh, of authorized departure? Uh, so as I've said, uh, the uh, safety, uh, security of uh, American citizens in Ethiopia uh, is, our, uh, uh, is among our highest uh, priorities. We are always looking at the security situation uh, to determine uh, what is um, appropriate given um, uh, the conditions on the ground. Our embassy in Addis remains open. It remains uh, operational. Uh, as you may know, uh, on November 3rd, uh, today, we did update the travel advisory for Ethiopia to level four. Uh, what that means is we are advising U.S. citizens uh, do not travel to Ethiopia. We are recommending that U.S. citizens in uh, Ethiopia uh, consider departing now using uh, commercial options that remain available. Uh, we understand that commercial, uh, commercial activity continues, uh, commercial um, air traffic continues uh, in and out of uh, Addis. Uh, those options uh, remain available, uh, and we are uh, urging American citizens 
uh, to look into those options. On November 2nd, yesterday, um, we released a security alert to U.S. citizens advising them uh, that uh, U.S. Embassy personnel are currently restricted from traveling uh, outside the city limits of, of Addis Ababa. Uh, the security alert also strongly suggests uh, that U.S. citizens uh, seriously reconsider uh, travel to Ethiopia uh, and those who are in Ethiopia consider uh, making preparations uh, to leave. So, of course, the security situation has evolved uh, even over the past 24 hours, and today we did issue that level four uh, travel advisory uh, urging Americans to depart the country now uh, using commercial options. Uh, beyond the messaging that our embassy in Addis is putting forward, we are also uh, reaching out to the diaspora community uh, here in uh, the United States uh, and um, uh, around the world uh, to ensure that to ensure wide distribution of these messages uh, when it comes to U.S. citizens uh, who may be uh, in Ethiopia. We will continue to provide uh, the latest and the best information we have uh, to the American citizen uh, community in uh, Ethiopia um, uh, going forward. Ethiopia? Uh, sorry, Ethiopia. Did any of you guys go to authorize departure for? Um Families and non-essential, non-emergency personnel last week, like I, on on Wednesday. We'll double check, but um, uh, obviously we we do make these public. Uh, I don't believe that uh, I don't believe that's out there, but uh, we did issue okay. a level four travel advisory today. The United Nations and uh, African Union. What do you think they could do to help the crisis in Ethiopia? Um, with the U.S. support, a Security Council meeting on on Ethiopia, or is the U.S. Supporting one, and um, or what can neighboring countries do? Uh, you mentioned Eritrea. Are there others that? What would you have? That, what would you have those organizations? Do? Well, when it comes to Eritrea uh, and the role that Eritrean forces have been playing in Ethiopia, we've been very clear for some time uh, about the urgent need for Eritrean forces to withdraw uh, from Ethiopia. They have been contributing to uh, the violence, contributing to the instability, uh, contributing to. Uh, the increasing uh, humanitarian emergency that has afflicted uh, far too many uh, Ethiopians in Tigray uh, and uh, in regions uh, beyond Tigray at this point. Uh, we have, uh, when it comes to Ethiopia more broadly, we've been working uh, in lockstep with uh, the African Union um, uh, well, beyond, well before uh, the uh, recent violence uh, escalated. The African Union has uh, an important role uh, to play in this. The United Nations uh, has an important role uh, to play in this. Uh, when we were in New York City for the UN General Assembly uh, in September, there were a number of discussions uh, on uh, the increasing threats to peace and stability uh, and security in uh, Ethiopia. Uh, and again, we're exploring uh, all options uh, that may be appropriate uh, given the actions, given the inaction of the various parties uh, in Ethiopia. Above all, we are calling on the Ethiopian government. Uh, we are calling on uh, the TPLF. Uh, we are calling on uh, Eritrean forces uh, to withdraw. Um, we are calling on all parties uh, to engage uh, in uh, dialogue, uh, to use restraint, uh, to end hostilities, uh, and to ensure civilians uh, and their rights uh, are protected. We have a number of tools at our uh, disposal, both uh, positive and negative uh, incentives for uh, various parties. We've put some of those on the table. We've utilized uh, some of those, uh, and we will continue to calibrate our response based on what we see, based on what we don't see uh, in the days and the weeks going forward. Uh, uh, Iran, anything else on Ethiopia? Uh, Iran? Iran just announced that the, the negotiations in Vienna will resume in, uh, on November 29. Can you confirm that you will be there, not directly, but indirectly, to, to be part of those negotiations? Well, um, we understand that uh, the uh, European External Action Service, uh, of course, has been coordinating uh, with the Iranians on their stated intent 
uh, to resume negotiations uh, before the end of this month. Uh, this uh, appears to have uh, just taken place, um, but we do welcome uh, the EU's announcement uh, that they have coordinated with all participants uh, and that talks on a mutual return to compliance uh, with the JCPOA uh, will resume for a seventh round on Monday, November 29th. Uh, Special Envoy Mali will again uh, lead U.S. participation in these talks. Uh, we've said this many times uh, before, but we believe it remains possible uh, to quickly reach and implement an understanding on a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA um, by closing the relatively small number of issues uh, that remained outstanding at the end of June when the sixth round uh, concluded. Um, we believe that if the Iranians are serious, uh, we can manage to do that uh, in relatively short order. But we've also been clear, uh, including as this pause has dragged on for uh, some time, that this window of opportunity will not uh, be open forever, um, and that uh, uh, in, uh, especially if Iran continues to take uh, provocative uh, nuclear steps. And together with the IAEA, we've expressed our concern uh, about a number uh, of those steps in recent days, uh, in recent weeks. So we certainly hope that when the Iranian delegation returns to Vienna later this month, uh, they do so ready to negotiate. Uh, they do so uh, ready to uh, negotiate uh, quickly and uh, in good faith as well. Uh, Saeed. Are you able to pass the issue? Sure. Okay. Very quickly. Uh, Ned, uh, there's been a letter signed by 200 members of uh, Republican members of Congress. There's a great deal of uh, push around town from Trusha groups and so on for you guys not to go through with the reopening of the consulate. Can you put this issue to rest and state the American commitment or the State Department's commitment to reopening the Jerusalem consulate? Uh, Saeed, we have been very clear uh, about this in May. Uh, the, we were very clear in October. Uh, we don't have anything new uh, to offer. Uh, so the consulate will reopen at one point? We, we've been very clear uh, about our intentions. Uh, you've heard this from the Secretary on a, on a number yeah. of times now. A couple more issues. Uh, there's also been a report by the United Nations that says that home demolitions, Palestinian home demolitions by the Israeli occupation forces increased by 21 percent. Do you have any comment on that? We've also been clear on this issue. Right. Um, we believe it is uh, critical for uh, the parties to refrain from unilateral action that exacerbate tensions and that undercut uh, efforts to advance negotiated two-state two solution. Uh, that certainly includes home demolitions. Mm -hmm. And lastly, your favorite topic, settlement. You know, uh, I know that you guys gave a, a very strong statement and so on, uh, but then the Israelis, they come around and pack the prime minister's office the claim that you are not going to do anything, you're not going to pressure Israel to, you know, you, you will, you know, that will be the extent of it. You know, just uh, the statement that is strongly, uh, it's not even condemning, but it's uh, sh strongly opposing uh, the settlement process. Now, I know Mr. Sullivan has met or me is meeting in Israel uh, with, you know, on Iran, but also on uh, construction. Can you update us on the latest or you? latest position on this? Well, uh, we have stated our position on this uh, in, in recent days. Uh, our position has not changed. Uh, you heard me discuss uh, our uh, position on steps, unilateral steps that exacerbate tensions uh, and that put a negotiated two-state solution further out of reach. Uh, we continue to believe that settlement activity uh, falls in that category. Hold on. Can you, uh, you, last week, the, there was a, I realize you weren't here, but there was a delegation or at least one guy from Israel who came to explain or to give you further explanation about the uh, designations of the Palestinian, six Palestinian NGOs as terrorist organizations. Uh, did, uh, other than saying that you met with him and you received his, his information, uh, can you say if you've gone over it and uh, what you make of the, of the information that he presented and whether you agree with the designation? I said last week that we look forward to receiving the delegation. We look forward to uh, hearing additional uh, details underlying these designations. Uh, there were uh, discussions last week. We appreciated the opportunity 
uh, to hear directly from our Israeli partners on this. But beyond that, I wouldn't want to go into the details of it. Well, yes. So does that mean that you have no position at all on, on the designations? Uh, it, it means that I'm not going to go into uh, discussions that uh, were private uh, oh, and that, right. and that, and that may discussions. have included. Do you have, do you have an opinion one way or the other on the Israeli designation of these six NGOs as terrorist organizations? I, I don't have an update for you. We've been very clear um, so about uh, we've been very clear uh, about the importance of a vibrant civil society uh, around the world. Uh, the United States will continue uh, to support that in each and every context. Uh, but I don't have an update for you. I get it. But, uh, that, regarding but you do understand that's an extremely broad answer to a, an extremely specific question about your specific question implicates uh, private diplomatic discussions that no, may well have uh, included I want to know uh, classified information as well. Look, a lot of your allies in Europe have come out and taken a stance about these designations. Why don't you? Are you just not ready to yet? Uh, we're or do you never. <laughs> Uh, Matt, I don't want to say never. Um, what I will say is that we just don't have an update to offer for you now. Uh, Blinken has met in uh, Glasgow with the Lebanese Prime Minister and with the UAE Foreign Minister on Lebanon to reconcile between uh, Lebanon and the UAE uh, countries. Uh, what did he? Was he able to achieve anything on this? And what are you working on specifically? Well, uh, when it comes to Lebanon and its relations uh, with uh, its, its uh, Gulf uh, neighbors, um, we urge that all diplomatic channels remain open between the parties to ensure meaningful dialogue uh, on the pressing issues facing Lebanon. You're right that uh, we had an opportunity yesterday in Glasgow to meet with uh, Prime Minister Makati. Uh, we had an opportunity yesterday to meet with the uh, Emirati foreign minister. We had an opportunity the day before that uh, to meet with the Saudi foreign minister. And in each and every one of those discussions, uh, as indicated by the readouts uh, and the tweets that we released, uh, there was a discussion uh, of Lebanon. Uh, and the crux of that discussion uh, was the challenges, the significant challenges, um, including the economic challenges and hardship, hardships that Lebanon faces. Uh, and uh, the United States continues to work uh, with our partners, including uh, our Saudi partners, our Emirati partners in this case, our French partners, uh, who have also um, uh, played a, a signif significant role here, uh, and in close coordination with uh, Prime Minister Makati and the Lebanese government uh, to uh, see to it that we can do all we can to support the Lebanese people, to support their uh, humanitarian uh, needs uh, and their growing humanitarian needs in light of the economic challenges uh, that Lebanon faces. Uh, so again, we'd refer you to uh, these, to our Gulf partners uh, to explain uh, and to speak to their positions. Um, but our position is that uh, diplomatic channels uh, should remain open uh, if we are to uh, seek to improve uh, the humanitarian conditions of the Lebanese people uh, seek to improve uh, the economic and, and broader challenges that Lebanon faces today. Well, just a quick follow-up to this. You know, you know how this crisis uh, exploded. There was basically a statement by the Minister of Information before he became minister, where he says that the war in, in Yemen was uh, nihilistic or futile, something like that, and the Houthis were defending themselves. Do you agree or disagree with, with, the, with, with the premise of his statement, uh, do you do you call for his resignation? You know, and uh, do, you, do you feel that this was blown way out of proportion? For instance, uh, we aren't going to uh, offer a position on uh, his employment. Um, what we can say, what I can say, uh, is that the notion uh, that the Houthis have been anything uh, but a destabilizing force and a force that has inflicted additional hardship on the people of Yemen, uh, that is not uh, an idea that we recognize. Uh, we have been very clear in condemning the Houthis' uh, assault, uh, including their ongoing assault uh, on, Mar on Marib, uh, other parts of Yemen uh, as well. Uh, the Houthis, uh, despite their claims to the contrary, uh, have been uh, a primary cause of the hardship that uh, the people of Yemen uh, face today. There have been credible Proposals put on the table, uh, proposals that the Republic of Yemen government, proposals that uh, Saudi authorities 
uh, have also uh, been behind, uh, that on which the Houthis have so far uh, been unwilling to uh, engage. So I will leave it to the Lebanese government uh, to speak to uh, the status of any ministers that may or may not uh, be within the coalition. Uh, but when it comes to Houthi activity, uh, when it comes to Houthi conduct, uh, we've been very clear about where the United States stands. Kyle. Do you support this resignation or do you support this resignation to solve the problem? Uh, we believe that uh, diplomatic relations, the channels of communication uh, between Lebanon and its partners uh, should remain open. Uh, we support steps that help advance that. Kyle. We're just processing this news. So um, I'm just wondering when these talks resume at the end of November, um, is it the U.S. understanding that they're going to resume where they left off or that you guys are going to have to go back to ground zero given there's new Iranian leadership? We've been very clear that uh, the talks, if they are to succeed, uh, if we are to close the remaining areas of disagreement, uh, they should start precisely where the sixth round of talks left off. Um, as you alluded to yourself. Uh, this announcement is, is just emanating today, uh, so we're not in a position to uh, offer too much beyond that. Um, but we have been uh, uh, unambiguous uh, when it comes to our position that there was tremendous progress achieved uh, in rounds one through six uh, of these talks in Vienna. It would be neither uh, productive uh, nor wise to take up from any other position uh, from where we left off uh, in June at the conclusion of the sixth round. And just one more question on that. So I know you guys have said there's no exact timeline for when parties can no longer return to the deal or it'll be useless. Um, but Rob Malley said, I think earlier or last month, that there's no chronological clock. It's a technological clock at some time. So how far do the Iranians have to go technically for the deal to no longer uh, be useful in the eyes of the U.S.? Uh, what we don't want to do is to provide uh, the Iranians or anyone else uh, with a blueprint uh, as to how they may push uh, the envelope. Uh, we've been uh, quite clear. Rob Malley has made this quite clear. Uh, Secretary Blinken has made this clear. The president uh, has made this clear. We still believe uh, there is a window uh, in which we can achieve a mutual return to compliance with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Uh, we still um, believe that's viable. We still believe that is in our national interest, uh, precisely because it would once again impose permanent and verifiable limits uh, on uh, Iran's nuclear program, and it would foreclose uh, Iran's ability to ever acquire uh, a nuclear weapon. But we've also uh, made the point that at some point, uh, Iran's, the advancements Iran has made, uh, the know-how that Iran has garnered throughout this process uh, will make a return to the JCPOA as it was uh, written and finalized in 2015 and implemented in 2016 um, not worth it as a proposition uh, for the United States and our partners. Uh, we are not there yet. Uh, Rob uh, has made the point, as you, as you pointed out, that uh, these are assessments based on our understanding of a number of factors. Uh, our understanding of what the Iranians uh, are, have been doing uh, in the interim, our understanding of what the so-called breakout time uh, may be, that is to say the time it would take Iran to produce the fissile material needed uh, for a nuclear weapon if they chose to pursue one. Um, we are continuing with uh, our partners, with our partners in the P5 plus one, uh, with our uh, allies and partners in the Middle East and beyond, uh, to compare notes uh, on Iran's status, on Iran's progress, uh, and we will make a determination uh, based on what is in our uh, national interests and what's in the national security interests uh, of our allies and partners. And this meeting is going to happen just four or five days after the Board of Governors, the, the BOG, uh, meeting in, in, uh, at the IAEA. There had been a push ahead of today's announcement to get the uh, Board of Go the Governors to actually censure Iran or to bring a resolution of, cond if not condemnation, of ex you know pretty much extreme disapproval for their, their activities that have been going on outside of the, the deal and 
in violation of other commitments that they've made to the IEA. Is that something you guys are prepared to forego now? Will you, will, will, you, will, will you seek to censure them at the Board of Governors before the indirect talks begin in Vienna? Uh, so I don't want to get ahead of uh, the Board of Governors. What I can say is that we have uh, the full uh, we have full confidence uh, in the IAEA. We have full confidence in Director General Grassi of the IAEA. Yeah, but this doesn't so, have to do with the actual IAEA. This has to do with the Board of Governors, which is something that you're on, even though you're no longer in the deal. It's something that the, 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 the you know, and if you ask the Director General, as you do, I know, he says, this isn't up to me. This is up to the members. So it is up to the members to decide whether they're going to bring a resolution to censure or wrong. And this meeting is going to happen on, I think on the 24th or the 25th, which is four or five days before the, now we understand the Vienna talks are going to begin. So is the U.S. interested in pursuing a, rent, a resolution of condemnation or censure, censure ahead of the presumption? I, I was speaking to our uh, full faith and confidence in the IAEA because they too, as you know, uh, have produced reports on Iran's activities uh, in recent months. We've expressed our concern uh, at those uh, reports. Uh, we've made clear that Iran's continued nuclear ex escalations are unconstructive, uh, that they are inconsistent with the stated goal that Iran has put forward of um, seeking to return to mutual compliance with the JCPOA. Uh, we've also been very clear that Iran's nuclear provocations and escalations won't provide Iran uh, with any additional uh, negotiating leverage uh, when talks uh, resume. But uh, as you know, uh, the Board of Governors is set to meet. I don't want to get ahead uh, of the Board of Governors, um, but we've made very clear where we stand uh, on those escalations uh, and uh, our concern with them. Uh, Nazir. Thank you very much, Matt. It's a good opportunity. I have a few questions that may be short answer. Number one, do we have any update uh, toward the uh, Taliban uh, government? And the second question, uh, what is the status of the Afghan embassy in Washington, D.C. And the uh, third question, the passport agency in Kabul issuing uh, passport, are these recognized by the United Nation, uh, United States? Sorry. And the last question, the uh, P2 are SIV visa. Some people still in Afghanistan left behind. Uh, they tried to leave Afghanistan, but they have difficulty. Number two, the P2 visa, how long is going to take? Did the State Department uh, started the processing because some people, they went to the third country, but still they have a lot of difficulty. Um, thank you for those. So, so let me uh, see if I can uh, address uh, all of them. Uh, you asked about uh, SIVs and, and P2s and the processing. Um, let me actually uh, take a step back and, and provide uh, an update there on our uh, efforts to facilitate uh, the departure of uh, those to whom we have a special commitment. And that, of course, includes uh, American citizens, that includes lawful permanent residents, uh, and that includes uh, Afghans uh, who have worked uh, for and with us over the years. Uh, as of today, um, we have assisted in the departure of 377 uh, U.S. citizens and 279 lawful permanent residents. That's in addition uh, to a number of Afghans to whom we have uh, a special commitment. Uh, there have been uh, two uh, additional flights, two flights yesterday. Uh, again, our goal is uh, to routinize uh, these operations so that those who wish uh, to leave Afghanistan have additional options uh, to do so. The United States will continue to directly support uh, the efforts of American citizens, of lawful permanent residents, of uh, Afghans to whom we have a special commitment uh, to do that again, uh, if they so choose. Uh, that gets us to your question uh, regarding uh, the production of uh, passports. Uh, we welcome uh, the production and provision uh, of travel documents. Uh, we know that uh, travel documents are uh, an important, um, in many cases, a prerequisite uh, to travel, including across borders. Uh, we know this is important for, uh, we've heard from the Taliban, that's important that people um, be uh, documented. We know from uh, our partners in the region as well uh, the priority they place on ensuring that those who transit through their countries have appropriate travel documents, uh, and that is why uh, we do welcome uh, the production uh, of, uh, of passports. 
Um, we are continuing to process uh, SIV applicants, special immigrant visa applicants at all uh, stages of the application process. Uh, when it comes to SIV holders, uh, those who have uh, completed the process, uh, we have uh, been able to work with uh, a number of them to facilitate their departure uh, from Afghanistan if they uh, have chosen to do so. But uh, again, uh, for everyone at every single stage of the process, uh, we are continuing uh, to uh, support them. And for those who are beyond uh, a certain stage in the process, uh, we are looking at processing alternatives, uh, knowing that uh, we are no longer able to provide uh, consular access and consular support um, on the ground uh, in Kabul, although we do uh, have a team on the ground in Doha um, that, uh, uh, where we are working uh, many of these uh, issues as well. When it comes to the Afghan government, we've been watching very closely um, uh, their conduct uh, because the point we've always made uh, it is that it, that it is not a question uh, of what we hear from them. Uh, it is a question of what we see them do. Uh, and this goes back to some of the very issues we were speaking to before. Uh, the United States, but also our allies and our partners uh, around the world have set forth a series of expectations uh, that we uh, need to see from the Taliban, uh, that we would need to see from any future uh, Afghan government. Uh, and among those expectations uh, are uh, freedom of movement and safe passage uh, for those who do uh, wish to leave Afghanistan, to, to go back to your question, uh, but also the protection of human rights, uh, including for uh, women and girls, ethnic minorities, uh, and others in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, the um, uh, the uh, facilitation of humanitarian aid, humanitarian access, not standing in the way of the much needed supplies uh, and assistance uh, for the people of uh, Afghanistan, and on that score, uh, the United States, as you may know, uh, just a couple days ago announced an additional $174 million uh, in humanitarian assistance, bringing uh, our uh, total humanitarian uh, assistance in 2021 uh, to some $474 million, uh, as I recall, some $4.2 billion uh, since um, uh, 2001. Uh, so we will continue uh, to watch uh, very closely uh, as uh, the Taliban uh, does or does not live up to its commitments. Uh, and we've also been very clear that we want to see a future, Af a future government in Afghanistan uh, that is uh, inclusive, uh, that represents uh, the will of uh, the people of Afghanistan, and again, that importantly uh, upholds the rights of all of Afghanistan's uh, citizens. Mitzi. Afghan embassy? Last one. Uh, it's the status of the Afghan embassy in Washington. I don't believe there's been any change to that status. Missy. Thank you. Uh, Ned, I'd like to ask you about the NSO group, uh, the entity designation. Um, what can you say about what the State Department or the U.S. government knows about Americans or people with U.S. numbers being hacked or being um, targeted for hacking um, as part of the NSO or the, uh, the other firm, I, I believe it's called Candiro. Um, and there was a report about, um, uh, a report from Israel saying that the Biden administration gave the Israeli government only an hour advance notice of this designation. Um, is that true? And it sort of gets to the question I'm hoping you can address what um, in, you know, what does, what can you say about the Israeli government's knowledge of the activities um, that NSO was conducting, um, including against people who the United States has advocated for in terms of, you know, political activists and human rights defenders and all of that? Thank you. Sure. Um, so uh, broadly speaking, uh, let me just um, level set and make sure everyone is, is um, following the issue you referred to. Um, this is that today, uh, the U.S. government added four entities, uh, four foreign companies, I should say, to the Department of Commerce's uh, entity list for engaging in activities contrary to the national security or foreign policy interests of the United States. Uh, this follows an October 2021 interim final rule uh, published by the Department of Congr uh, Commerce establishing controls of certain items that can be used for malicious cyber activities. Uh, the four entities are located in Israel, 
uh, Russia and Singapore. Uh, when it comes to uh, the two companies that you mentioned, the NSO Group and Kandiru, uh, they were added to the entity list because investigative information has shown that these companies developed and supplied spyware to foreign governments that uh, used tools to maliciously target government officials, journalists, business people, activists, academics, academics and embassy workers. Uh, NSO Group developed and supplied this tool, so uh, Pegasus as it's known, uh, to governments that used it to maliciously target government officials, journalists, business people, activists, uh, academic, academics, and embassy uh, personnel. Uh, it's important to note that we are not taking actions against any countries uh, in which the four entities are located uh, or the governments uh, themselves. Uh, this is about the conduct uh, of these uh, private companies. Uh, when it comes to the notifications uh, that were involved uh, in this action, look, I don't want to speak to um, uh, or discuss private diplomatic conversations uh, other than to note that, uh, as is the case with all announcements of this kind, uh, partner governments are notified uh, in advance, and that was the case here. Okay, just a, the, the first question was, do you know, can you say whether or not the U U.S. government has knowledge that Americans, including allegedly Rob Malley, were targeted by um, NSO? I, I think you would understand why we just wouldn't uh, entertain that, that question from here. Uh, but as I said before, um, investigative information uh, had led uh, the U.S. government to conclude uh, that these private entities uh, should be listed uh, under the Department of, Co Department of Commerce uh, entity list, and we did uh, confirm and announce that today. Would, would be likely to sue against Israel? Will there be any punitive measures? Uh, so there are uh, punitive measures against these companies, uh, and uh, the inclusion of these companies uh, on the entity list is itself a powerful tool. Um, the entity list uh, is used by the Department of Commerce's Bureau of Industry uh, and Security to restrict the export, re-export, and in-country transfer of items subject to the Export Administration uh, regulations uh, to um, persons, and that includes to individuals, to organizations, uh, to companies reasonably believed to be involved, have been involved, or pose a significant risk uh, to being or becoming involved uh, in activities contrary to the national security or foreign policy interests uh, of the United States. So it does impose additional restrictions on these entities, yes. Just to follow up, you know, you say that this is not, obviously it's not imposed on a country, but um, NSO Group has uh, export licenses granted by the Israeli military. You know, you've got a really close ally that has um, granted licenses to this company. You know, do, do you expect them to take action in in, res in response to the the investigative findings that you've you've got here? And have you shared those with uh, with Israel or the Israeli military? Well, look, uh, is Israel, of course, um, is a steadfast friend, uh, steadfast uh, partner. Uh, in that vein, we have, we have raised uh, this conduct with, uh, of these companies uh, with the government of Israel, and we look forward to further discussions uh, with the government of Israel about ensuring that these companies' products uh, are not used to target human rights defenders, uh, journalists, uh, and others who should be protected. And if you ask Russia to take action against you know, entities in their country that are carrying out ransomware and cyber attacks on the U.S., why wouldn't you ask Israel to do the same thing? Uh, well, I think in this case you're referring to um, criminals, uh, private criminal actors uh, in Russia. Uh, and we've been very clear that every responsible country has an obligation uh, to take action against criminals operating within their territory. Uh, in this case, uh, we are talking about uh, conduct of private companies that we see as contrary uh, to our national security interests. We have uh, had conversations. Uh, with our Israeli partners about the conduct of the NSO group. Uh, we will continue to have uh, those conversations uh, in private uh, to make clear our concerns. Yes. Press from Brazil. Uh, Brazil has announced new goals and commitments on the climate issues these days in the COP. Uh, could this new announcement can help the, to improve the relations between Brazil and the US in advanced partnerships and create new partnerships? or the U.S. are awaiting more bold movements and effective results from Brazil to advance? Uh, thank you. So uh, in the run-up to uh, COP26, 
uh, including in the climate summit uh, that the president convened uh, some weeks ago uh, and since. Uh, we have seen a number of uh, bold commitments from countries uh, around the world. Uh, the United States, uh, in our own commitments, uh, by announcing that uh, we would reduce our emissions by between 50 and 52 percent by 2030, uh, our goal was not only to help stave off the existential threat uh, of climate change, uh, but to have a catalytic impact and to galvanize uh, action on the part of governments uh, around the world. Uh, we know that countries that are uh, among the world's um, leading emitters, uh, the United States uh, certainly falls in that category, Brazil uh, certainly falls in that category. We have a special uh, responsibility uh, to do what we can, uh, again, to combat the climate crisis, uh, but also to demonstrate leadership uh, and to demonstrate uh, action. Uh, so commitments are important, uh, follow through uh, is also important. Uh, I suspect that uh, as COP26 continues for uh, the next week and a half or so, uh, we will hear additional commitments from countries around the world, um, knowing that uh, this is what the president has called the decisive decade. Uh, the action that we take now or uh, the inaction uh, that uh, we see now um, will be determinative. Uh, in terms of our ability or not uh, to keep global, global warming uh, below 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, the level at which scientists have told us um, is uh, absolutely imperative uh, if we are to stave off uh, the worst effects uh, of climate change. Uh, so we welcome uh, announcements from countries around the world. We continue uh, to urge uh, our partners uh, to raise their climate ambition uh, knowing that only by doing so uh, will we be able to make good uh, on the commitments that were put forward in Paris uh, some uh, years ago now, um, but even more importantly, uh, to stave off the worst effects of climate change, uh, knowing that this is uh, the decisive decade. Sure. Uh, Mr. Blinken mentioned that President Ghani has been agreed with him to hand over the power to the Taliban government without fight. But when Ghani escapes, everything got changed. If it was agreed before that, Taliban come to the power, then what is the difference? Uh, I don't know, you got my... I, I do, I do. So this is something that uh, we have spoken to. Secretary Blinken has, has, has spoken to this. Uh, our former uh, special representative for Afghanistan, uh, Zalman Khalilzad, uh, has also uh, spoken to this. But in the days uh, prior to the collapse of uh, the Afghan government that was precipitated uh, by President Ghani's decision to flee the country, uh, we were engaged in intense, intense diplomacy uh, with our Afghan partners, with the Ghani government, uh, but also with the Taliban, uh, on a means by which uh, to uh, stave off what we feared could be massive violence uh, if uh, the Taliban's military offensive continued. Uh, and so there was, uh, there were discussions uh, and there was uh, a framework in place that we believe uh, could have transitioned power um, to a government uh, that included the Taliban, uh, but was also inclusive and representative uh, of the Afghan people. Uh, to us, uh, uh, that would have been uh, a means by which to protect some of the important gains uh, over the past uh, 20 years, including uh, for Afghanistan's people, its women, its minorities, um, uh, while staving off the potential for violence. Now, of course, uh, with the fall of the Afghan government, uh, with the uh, steady advances uh, of the Taliban, uh, that uh, diplomacy, uh, those discussions uh, became for naught. But again, our emphasis on seeing to it that any future Afghan government uh, respects the rights of its people, uh, is representative of the will of its people, uh, our emphasis on that has uh, not abated at all. It continues to be uh, a guiding principle uh, for our engagement uh, with the Taliban. It continues to be a guiding principle um, in our discussions with allies uh, and partners. And you've heard that same message uh, put forward from our allies and partners to the Taliban as well. We'll take a final quick question. Thank you very much. Uh, the have uh, 
reportedly say uh, Turkey brought the S-400 uh, missile batteries to Angelic uh, Air Base uh, where uh, the U.S. And NATO, uh, and NATO forces are. Uh, can you confirm that and uh, what's your comment on it? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of your question, that Turkey brought the S-400 uh, uh, missile system to the... Ah, ah, got it, got it. Um, uh, look, uh, we have been uh, quite clear on our position uh, regarding the S-400 in, in, in Turkey. Uh, as you know, President Biden and President Erdogan uh, has an, had an opportunity uh, within the past uh, couple of days in Rome uh, to uh, have a bilateral discussion. Uh, President Biden uh, reaffirmed our defense partnership and Turkey's importance as a NATO ally. Um, but in that meeting, the president also noted uh, concerns over Turkey's possession uh, of the Russian S-400 uh, missile uh, system. So we've made our concerns with this system very clear. We've made the implications uh, of that uh, possession of the S-400 very clear as well, including in the context uh, of the F-35 program. Can I correct something that I said? So just for transparency. This is uh, a welcome change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was, uh, sorry, I said, I, I think I said in a question earlier that, that, that Addis, that Embassy Addis is on Earth is Khartoum. Ah. It was wet to authorize departure last Wednesday. That's correct. That's correct. Not Addis. That's correct. Sorry. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone.